Okay. Megan, your screen's cut off. Yeah, how's that? You see that? Yep. Great. Okay, so again, thanks everyone. We're clearly having some technical issues, but I'm really glad that we can um, give you our quarterly update on, on the various things that we're doing here at the Drupal Association. It's always a pleasure to be able to um, let our supporters have a little more insight into what we're focusing on, um, what we're moving um, moving forward on your behalf as a, a business that's supporting Drupal, um, and how we're um, helping the community come together as well. So um, just a few things. Uh, if you can just stay muted during the call, that way we don't record everyone typing. If you have questions, you can use the chat window. And um, you, know, you can always tweet anything you hear. Uh, by all means, share what you're learning, and you can um, use our handle at Drupal Association. Uh, and so if um, you want to listen to this later, we are recording it. We're going to email it to all supporters as well. Uh, today, we'll just go over some top news items here at the Drupal Association. And then Carrie is going to talk about some changes to the supporter program. Uh, and then we are going to just give some highlights on DrupalCon, and Tim will then talk about Drupal.org. But of course, we want to first just thank all of our supporters, starting with the signature supporters uh, and our premium supporting partners, as well as the supporting partners. And those are the Drupal agencies that are uh, coming together to support us. Uh, but we also have technology and hosting companies, uh, in addition to the ones you saw on the signature slide. Uh, these are the premium levels that are uh, supporting the, the program and recognizing that they are also benefiting from Drupal and wanting to give back, and those that are at the supporter level. And of course, all the funding goes to improving Drupal.org, which is the home of the project and allows us to bring everyone together to build the software and providing the tools that everybody needs, um, as well as uh, doing the initial work we've started to do, which is promoting the software um, with some of the redesign we've done on the home page as well as the, the recent industry pages. So just a little update on some Drupal Association news. As uh, you may know, there's been a lot of community discussions over the last couple months about how we can improve community health. And that starts with uh, remodeling governance, how we make decisions um, by and for the community of how we decide how we want to operate together and move forward together as a community. Um, and so we, as the association, want to support this effort that the community wants to own, uh, but they do need some support. And so we have um, hired Whitney Hess to run community discussions. They are mediated discussions that started at DrupalCon Baltimore, and then they uh, happened virtually online at different times. So people all around the world would have the opportunity to join and share their thoughts, their needs in terms of community governance. And that um, has concluded, and now Whitney is preparing a summary of everything that she's heard, where there's agreement on how to move forward, and some proposed next steps that she was hearing from the community. So you'll be hearing um, from her soon. We'll put out a blog post. Uh, but you know, some really, some really great things. I think um, you can hear some more in a recent podcast that she and I just did um, with Lullabot. Uh, the good thing is, that I think I heard coming from her was, People don't feel that community governance needs to be thrown out the, the door, that there's a lot of good things. We just need to build off of what we have today and just evolve it. Um, so the other bit of news is that DrupalCon Vienna is happening in September and registration has opened as well as um, call for papers. So we certainly encourage you to participate and get involved. This is a, another great community event where we kind of break down those international barriers and let people come together, share ideas, and learn and grow as a community. So we'll hope, hope you'll participate in that. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some more news that you can just follow by um, reading our newsletters that go out monthly. So let me hand this over to Carrie, and she is going to talk a little bit about the supporter program and um, how we're evolving it to create more value for you as a business. So okay. Thanks, Megan. So I'm talking about some new and improved benefits um, that we 
brought to the program last month. Um, so as I'm sure most of you know, funding from the partner program helps build a successful Drupal ecosystem. And all funding from these partner programs goes directly to support Drupal.org and our engineering team. So some recent D.O improvements include Drupal CI functional testing, project application process revamp that helps open up Drupal con contribution to a wider audience, as well as a Drupal.org homepage revamp that helps show evaluators why Drupal is the right choice for them. Next slide. So some supporting partner benefits were going unused because our partners weren't seeing the value in them. Um, now that Drupal 8 is out, we want to direct more attention to promoting Drupal adoption within our channels, including Drupal.org. We want to better align our supporter benefits with our mission, as well as with what supporters value the most. So we've been talking to our supporters to see what they do find valuable. Um, some things that kept on coming up were leads, brand visibility, as well as thought leadership. So these new benefits provide this kind of value. And they include contribution credits uh, for signature and premium level supporters. It includes case study promotion on the front page, as well as a featured Drupal.org news post. That's great. Then, Here, if I could just ask a quick question in terms sure. of those benefits, um, you know, how do they how do they help with the, the value that that supporters are looking for? Sure. If you scroll to the next slide, I kind of go into some of the <laughs> details. Um, so contribution credits is our way of acknowledging that there are many ways to contribute to the project. Um, we often say it's time, talent, and treasure. So organizations that are supporters will get a range of contribution credits depending on their supporter level. Um, and then as you may know, contrib credits help your ranking within the marketplace. Um, so credits are tied to your org through your supporter badge on your profile. So if you're currently a supporter and you have that badge, you already have these contrib credits associated to your organization. And then on the next slide, um, a lot of the new benefits include homepage visibility. So the homepage sees 350,000 visits a month. That's our highest traffic page on the site. And 50% of the visitors are new to Drupal.org. Um, about Drupal, try Drupal and case studies generally see the highest engagement rates. So we've made certain assumptions about this audience. Um, they're primarily technical ev evaluators that are coming to learn more about Drupal. Um, so these, the featured news stories and case studies will help turn the homepage into a Drupal marketing tool and provide visibility and leads for supporters. So along with organic news, the homepage newsfeed will amplify your content that's compelling to the technical evaluator. And then featured news cities will just make sure that we've got fresh and compelling brand names routine out on the homepage um, on a more regular basis. Uh, benefits that we're eliminating are the run of site banner ads, the association newsletter article and blog post, as well as the promotion of a pre recorded webcast and the DA newsletter ad. And I'll go into a little bit about the why. Um, some companies just didn't take advantage of. The run of site ads, it's really low volume in general, and the ads are pretty deep in the site, so it's reaching more Drupal developers rather than their target audience of evaluators. Um, and same with the newsletter and blog posts. Um, it generally reaches other Drupal businesses, but not necessarily technical evaluators. Um, and then lastly, we're eliminating the pre-recorded webinar, uh, which was just, quite frankly, pretty difficult for people to support and produce. Um, and then I just want to say a quick thank you for your support. Uh, your account manager should have already been in touch about these new benefits. And if you have unused visibility benefits that we're eliminating, you'll have the opportunity to keep them until your agreement runs out or transition to the new benefits. So if you have additional questions, you can reach out to Delana Lang or Mark Brandsetter for uh, more questions. That's great. Okay. And we're always listening to our supporters and what their needs are. So this is, um, just a, an example of how we've gone through, um, you know, an exercise to, to get feedback from the different supporters to find out how we can make this more valuable because we really, you know, it, it really matters that you're contributing to fund Drupal.org improvements. There's so much more we need to be doing um, and can be doing. And um, so we want to make sure that we, you know, keep you as a supporter, you find value in this and, and, um, and hopefully we'll be attracting even more supporters. There's a lot more companies out there benefiting from Drupal and 
we want them to see the value in giving back as well and, and how that ultimately comes back and has returns for them. So um, with all that said, please know that we are listening. If you have other ideas of how we can create value for supporters, please let us know. Uh, we're always looking for new ideas. So thank you. And thanks, Carrie. So let's just talk a little bit about DrupalCon. Um, one of the things we wanna do for our business community is make sure we're creating value through the two channels that we manage, which is DrupalCon as well as Drupal.org. And as it relates to DrupalCon, we want to grow attendance, but we also wanna lean into more of that adoption journey. Um, DrupalCon definitely supports our contribution journey and helps those come together to work on the project. We have sprints and we have core conversations for people to talk about what to do next with, this, with, the, with the code. Um, but we also want to use this event to make sure we're talking to um, you know, people that are using Drupal and get them to fall back in love with it and learn how to do more with the software. We also want to get evaluators in so that they go to the exhibit hall and find partners to work with and that they also fall in love with Drupal and make the, the choice to go with the software for their organization. And um, so we're, we have um, some more work to do to really understand the, the purchasing process basically within the end user um, and and who we really need to be bringing into the event and curating content for. Uh, it's, a, it's a big effort because we are evolving the focus of this event here in DrupalCon North America. Um, but we have definitely started taking our steps in that direction. Um, I think by having the, the event in Baltimore, which is on the East Coast for the first time in years, just really helped us get into a whole new audience of, of people pulling from you know, Philly to, to, to DC, et cetera, up and down that 95 corridor. Um, and it resulted in us having uh, our second highest attendance ever for DrupalCon, which was um, really wonderful. I think one of the things that um, I found really encouraging was that Drupal training kept selling out, um, especially mastering Drupal 8. It sold out, we expanded it, it sold out again. Um, it's just things like that that are showing that, that there's some uptick in, in Drupal 8 adoption. And, and I'm starting to look at how we can see DrupalCon as a leading indicator for Drupal adoption and Drupal health. Um, so anyhow, there's uh, some other things that I thought were pretty notable. Um, uh, our, on Monday, we also have industry summits, and um, this is one of the ways we're leaning into that adoption journey. We're doing industry-specific summits, provides peer-to-peer -peer networking, um, sharing knowledge within that industry through case studies, and people can talk in a safe space about their common pain points and how they can um, address them and um, we're finding that it's really successful. We did it for nonprofit and government, higher ed, uh, and media and publishing. So we were able to expand that. It was really successful. The nonprofit summit, 100% of the attendees said they were satisfied to very satisfied. Um, we just know that we, we are really focusing in the right area here. Um, a lot of these came from industry specific BOFs. Uh, birds of a feather, um, and then they grew into these summits. So we're looking to see how we could nurture other summits in the markets that we know are growing for Drupal, such as healthcare or finance. We definitely want to see what we can do um, to start growing some interest there as well in the conference. Another thing that's really important to bake into the DNA of any conference, especially tech and especially open source conferences, is diversity. Um, you know, GitHub just put out a survey that showed that in open source, diversity is really low. What they were showing is about 3% of, of um, conference attendees are of one of the underrepresented groups. Uh, we are very fortunate that Drupal has uh, much more diversity and focus on inclusion, something I'm very proud of. Um, and we uh, worked with, um, many people in the community uh, and the track chairs to kind of lean into that even more so for this DrupalCon. Um, and one of the things we did was we reached out to underrepresented groups and even provided some funding to help them, you know, people that had great content to share that, uh, and, and it helped them come to the event to share their content. Um, and so it just, you know, we were able to kind of measure 
what our diversity levels were in terms of speakers and attendees. Um, so we have a good benchmark now that we want to grow grow from. Um, but I think the, the numbers really show that their, their efforts paid off with 29% of the session submissions from speakers um, had self-identified as coming from the underrepresented groups. Um, so something we're, we're very proud of and we'll continue to work on. Um, we also, in terms of, you know, we're, we're kind of still going through all the session feedback. Uh, we usually find out what were the top 10 most popular and most attended sessions. Um, but one that we do know is that um, for those that are sponsoring DrupalCon, even though it's a paid session versus a community selected session, they're still highly attended. And actually, um, Fastly, which is one of our supporters and sponsors of the event, uh, had one of the top 10 highest rated sessions. Um, and so I think we have been doing a good job kind of coaching our business community on how to really create content that sells at, at a session. And by sell, I mean, uh, we're coaching you not to sell, but to educate, just to be more specific there. Uh, and then also, as we were talking with our sponsors and looking at the survey, we're finding that um, the, the people felt there were more leads coming in. There was more interest um, from evaluators. Um, so we're hearing some good feedback there too. So it seems that as we're leaning into this adoption journey and trying to get the right content and, uh, and acquire the right attendees for businesses that, you know, we're moving in the right direction. We know we still have work to do. And actually I'll be flying out to Portland tomorrow, no, today, <laughs> in a few hours, um, to go meet with the team so that we can think about how we can do even more to unleash um, uh, our, our marketing abilities to, um, to attract in more attendees at DrupalCon. So just wanted to let you know um, some of the ways that we're investing in this conference and keeping, keeping you and your business in mind. Another thing that we announced at DrupalCon Baltimore is that we have a new brand. And for anyone who didn't get to hear that message, I just wanted to share it with you. In the past, every DrupalCon had its own brand. And you can see the nice assortment here. They're beautiful. Um, but at the end of the day, as we're trying to promote Drupal and DrupalCon beyond the Drupal sphere, uh, we need to have a brand identity that really resonates and is consistent. Uh, and so we went through an effort to find um, uh, an agency that would work with us on creating a consistent brand. And in the end, this is through the whole process, what was created and it is designed to represent that Drupal is both uh, a blend of um, that human element as well as that technology element. And they come together in DrupalCon to create this amazing environment of of, of learning and building upon each other's knowledge and um, kind of coming together as a community as well. And so we're excited to be able to show this um, new brand identity, uh, starting with DrupalCon Nashville. Um, as you know, sponsorships have already launched, so you might have seen some of the graphics there with the splash page that's out there. But um, the whole idea is that we will be promoting DrupalCon first, not the city, which is what we were doing before, but we'll still have images that highlight the city that we're in, and we'll still be doing special iconic branding that captures the spirit of the city that we're going into. So you can see what we've done with Nashville and the guitar. Um, so I, there's still a lot of fun and play that we can have with the branding. But at the end of the day, what we're really trying to achieve is that consistent brand that resonates beyond the Drupal walls because ultimately we are trying to reach beyond our own community to invite people to come in. Uh, the other thing too is that this just saves us a ton of time and even allows us to shift our resources um, to do more for the community um, rather than reinventing and reskinning our sites uh, every DrupalCon. So there's some, some, real, some other benefits going on too. Uh, so, uh, let me shift this over to Tim now who can tell you a little bit more that's happening in our other channel, which is Drupal.org. Yeah, I'd be very happy to. So, there's um, quite a lot that's happened over the course of the, well, since our last quarterly update. 
Um, and the first topic you might have heard about if you attended uh, Baltimore, but I'll um, reiterate it here. It's a really, really big uh, change for the community. So um, just to give some background history for um, pretty much the entire history of the, of the project, um, the, uh, to, in order to contribute a new module or a new theme to Drupal.org, you first had to go through a project application process. And back in the day, this was for historical reasons about how we managed how the code got into the repositories, but um, it's become a kind of legacy burden on new contribution. And speaking with a number of supporters, whether they're shops or technology supporters um, who uh, you know, may have their own tools that they want to integrate with Drupal, it's been a big barrier um, to people to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm building this site for a client. We need to integrate with this awesome new service that's out there. Um, but I can't contribute that back, or I can't do it in an easy way. Um, so what we've done is completely opened the project application gate process. Um, you can now create full projects on Drupal.org without having to go through a manual review. Um, and instead of that, we are now putting new signals about project quality um, on the pages to try and make sure that we still give evaluators the, all of the information they need to know which projects are right uh, for their Drupal sites. Um, so if you advance to the next slide. Um, so one of the sets of signals it relates to security coverage, because this is one of the biggest concerns we heard when working with the community to figure out how to make this change. Um, previously, the way that you knew that a module um, had received security advisories in the event of a disclosed vulnerability um, was if it had a stable release and a full project on Drupal.org. And that was pretty much the only way to know. And it was kind of insider knowledge. Um, to make this something that's more useful to the community at large, we put, we're now putting signals directly on the projects. So you will see these shield icons um, and indications of which projects will get uh, security advisory coverage from the security team. And just as a reminder, that doesn't mean they're going through and trying to make these modules secure. It's just a responsible disclosure policy um, if any security issues were to be discovered. And that'll help our evaluators understand which modules to use. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is what some of the signals look like um, if, you, uh, if a project is not yet covered. So we have to provide that information to, have, to let people uh, incorporate that as part of their decision making uh, process. Uh, again, when evaluating modules. And this is what you'll see by default. Um, now the security coverage process, that is still something of an opt-in. So if you want to be able to get those green badges and shield icons, there's a process for that that you can look at when you're going through your uh, um, project submissions. Um, and then finally, uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, this is, this is what that process looks like. So you get this opt-in option on the project pages, um, and you get warnings about when you're making releases to say, hey, maybe you want to have security advisory coverage before you release the full version of your module. Um, and then if we continue to the next slide, the, the other thing that we're doing around project quality signals is that we're working on ways to not just provide security signals, but provide signals um, about why you might want, might want to use a particular module for other reasons. So the most basic one that's already out there is just starred modules. So you can see uh, a, someone who's trying to discover modules can now actually see which ones are the most popular, which is a, a great signal, most widely used. Um, we already have information about how much usage the various modules have. Um, and we weight those into search, so you can get the most popular, most widely used modules and be looking at those when you're looking for something to use. And then we're looking at adding additional signals related to code quality based on um, some automatic tooling that comes with Drupal CI that we could then expose on project pages to say, um, you know, this is fully following coding standards. This has this is got all the, the polish and shine uh, to be used in a production environment. Um, so that's what we're doing, or that's what we did with the project application process, and we're still doing a little follow-up work here and there. But I think it's one of the biggest changes um, for Drupal.org in really years, um, uh, and one of the biggest changes for the project that will really open up contribution. Um, so if we continue to the next topic, I'd also like to talk about the developer tools evaluation, which is a big kind of long-term initiative for the project. Um, and uh, again, I talked about this a little bit at Baltimore, and so you can get a little more detail if you go and look up our D.O. panel um, uh, in the Baltimore sessions. But basically, we're evaluating um, whether to continue down the road of custom building our contribution tools using Drupal on Drupal.org, 
or finding ways to integrate with major open source tooling providers like GitLab or GitHub. And you've seen a series of blog posts posted to drupal.org about this process, but let me just give you an update about where we are in the evaluation. So if you go to the next slide, the um, process started with an initial evaluation and then a deep dive with the staff um, uh, with the uh, technical advisory committee, which is a, a group of advisors consisting of um, you know, a couple community members and one member of the board. Um, and then we made some initial recommendations at the board level about what we thought we should pursue further. And we communicated out this shortlist that that was those three options of Drupal.org, GitHub, or GitLab uh, that you saw on the previous slide. And there's a blog post about some of our initial evaluation there. And now we're moving into this phase of trying to prototype what the different options could look like, doing um, sort of alpha work to, to see what those integrations are and look out for gotchas um, or look out for workflow issues so that we can kind of preserve that um, those uh, positive and unique elements of the Drupal workflow while still modernizing the tooling. Um, so that's the phase we're in right now and continuing to work on that. And there'll be more updates um, either in blog form or as part of these updates or at the next DrupalCon um, as time goes on. Um, let's see here. And if we continue. Um, so yeah, the next steps, like I said, we're going to learn by doing. We're, we're exploring a prototype. We want to see if we can pilot these tools, probably with an initial contrib project. And then we want to, at some point, we want to have this in a place where the community can actually like use these things a little bit and help us do some kind of final gap analysis, help us see what we missed. So, uh, and then I have one more topic for today that I'd love to update everybody on. Um, if you go to the next slide. So, uh, this is my favorite GIF on the entire internet. Um, I use it to represent the uh, Drupal.org infrastructure. Um, it's quite the Rube Goldberg machine of Rube Goldberg machine of moving parts and pieces. Um, and we put out in March a uh, RFP for uh, to find a vendor to help us manage infrastructure services so that our internal engineering team can focus on feature development primarily and not so much on maintenance and provisioning of machines. So if you go to the next slide. Um, these next two slides, because it's too long to fit on one page, is kind of a diagram of what the existing infrastructure looks like. So you can see that um, from end user back to, the, back to the basic infrastructure, we go through our Fastly CDN layer. We then have a series of VM hosts where we run instances uh, that provide all of the different services for Drupal.org, whether that's our Git services, Solar for Search, our development environments, uh, all sorts of things like that. If you go to the next slide, you can see where we keep some bare metal servers um, for the like really um, uh, the, the services that we need truly high performance, like our uh, database servers um, and some of our media serving. Um, and then we also have a portion of our infrastructure that happens in the cloud, primarily uh, Drupal CI, uh, dynamically scaling AWS spot instances. So this is kind of the scope of everything that we're trying to manage. Um, and really find someone to help us manage so that we can focus on features and not just on this architecture. Um, so if you go to the next slide, so the, by finding this partner, it'll help us internally keep focused on the mission. So if we're successful, we get to focus on feature development, on, um, on the sites themselves and the services that directly serve the mission of the association, on project improvements, and then the partner can manage underlying infrastructure for us. Um, so to talk about where we are in the process, on the next slide, I've laid out something of the timeline. But basically, we started post with posting an RFI to see who might be interested. We received all those letters of interest by the 24th of March um, and had actually quite a lot of interest in, in potential participation in the program and sent out the full RFP. Uh, those proposals were due uh, towards the end of April. Um, and since once we received all the proposals, we've been reviewing them internally and scheduling interviews with leading vendors. And we are now in kind of the home stretch to make a decision. So you can look out for um, more information about that in the coming weeks when we announce the decision and how we're moving forward. Um, but we're really excited about it as a way to um, help refocus our own limited resources on that core mission work that we really want to do. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Lots of work happening. So, uh, so thank you for that overview. Um, I just wanted to see, are there any questions from the group? I'm gonna just stop sharing. 
And if you have questions, you can use either the chat or the Q&A function in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. All right, I see we have some comments already in here. Yeah, one, one existing question was just whether or not would the um, existing con sites uh, change to the new branding model. All the existing sites will retain their, 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 their current designs. It'll only be moving forward that the new brand is implemented. All right, well, if there's no other questions, um, uh, feel free to email us at any time. If, you, if something comes to mind, we're always here and, and eager to hear from you and, and to work with you. So just reach out. Um, I think you probably have your account manager's email, but you can also reach out to me directly at megan at association.drupal.org. Um, just don't tweet that email out, please. And um, anyhow, just thank you so much for funding this work that we just shared with you. And there's so much more we didn't have time to get to. We just wanted to give you the highlights. Uh, but we will certainly keep you abreast of uh, other news and our monthly updates. And uh, we'll talk to you again at our next quarterly uh, webinar. So thanks for your time and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Hi, thanks.